Hey Epifare, this week we have an insane collection of AI news, Mercedes is putting TikTok and Zoom into a car for some reason, and USB-C is finally coming to the next iPhone, but with a twist. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by our streaming service, Nebula. Okay, we'll start the brief with the new battlefield for flip phones, the outer cover display. First, Ice Universe suggested that the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 5 will have a huge one that will make even the Oppo Find N2 Flip look modest, and renders of the next Motorola Razr 2023 suggest a similar solution as well. Not bad. I guess at some point they'll just make the outer screen so big that you don't have to flip the phone at all. That would be pretty cool. Oh wait. Next, Stripe finally did what it did on iOS first, which is turning Android smartphones into payment terminals so that these can receive payments in select countries via tap to pay on NFC enabled devices. Also this week, good guy Microsoft announced bringing all Xbox games that work on PC to Nvidia's GeForce Now cloud gaming service, and also that future Xbox games will come to Nintendo in another 10 year agreement. This sudden generosity is obviously a reaction to lawmakers threatening threatening to block their acquisition of Activision, a huge gaming company, and if you've ever needed proof that just even just the threat of antitrust action is actually good for the end consumer, well, now you have it. Then Lenovo launched a new laptop in China called the Kaitian N8, and the only reason that it's worth mentioning here is that it actually uses a new Zhaoxin processor. This is a China-based semiconductor company that builds x86 chips, and it's basically the only company outside of AMD and Intel that has a license to do so and to run desktop operating systems like Windows. Next, Google Chrome, which is notorious for being a hungry, hungry hippo when it comes to RAM, has started enabling both energy saver and memory memory saver modes by default on computers, which automatically put Chrome tabs that aren't currently in use to sleep to free up RAM, promising significant improvements. Fingers crossed that it actually works. And finally, I found this new spy balloon simulator kind of hilarious, which lets you launch a balloon that lets you see it move around the Earth using actual atmospheric data to see where it would traverse around the globe. Pretty cool. Okay, that's it for the brief, and you know how I've been joking about turning the Friday Checkout into AI News Weekly? Well, that's gonna be the first story of this week, because man, do we have an insane number of major announcements. So we're starting with Spotify, which added an AI DJ into their app for US and Canadian users. They use OpenAI tool to create curated playlists where an AI voice will talk in between like a sort of radio hosts, giving you commentary about the tracks and the artists that you might like, and it will even do things like remind you of a nostalgic playlist that you had on repeat last year. I can't access this feature here in Germany, but here's a quick demo from another Twitter user. This is the first single off Joy's upcoming album, Proof of Life, due out in April. She produced the song herself. It's a super light, jazzy acoustic track. You can catch Joy on tour with John Mayer this spring and with Noah Cahan this summer. Here it is, Changes. That sounds like a pretty cool tool. And I mean, I personally don't want to have anyone talking to me while I listen to music because I want to concentrate. But if you're somebody who, for example, drives over long distances, or maybe you have to sit at your job for a long time and not really do anything, you're a security guard or God knows what, then maybe this tool would be pretty cool. Then note-taking app Notion also just rolled out its AI tool, which you can ask to generate brand new text, just like ChatGPT, but also to review text that you've already written, maybe to change the length or the tone of it, or to create a summary of it, or to highlight action items from it, and so on. I've tried it briefly since we use Notion with my editor and researcher Tristan, and it's actually worked pretty well. This is a place where AI tools definitely seem to make sense, though Notion AI is a paid upgrade after a free trial. Next, and still in AI news, Microsoft just expanded the new Bing AI to Android, iOS, Edge Mobile, and also Skype. It now also supports voice commands, and inside Skype, you can add Bing AI to conversations and talk to it through there. Microsoft is making moves very aggressively, although you'll still need to be on their waiting list to get started. And finally, China is jumping on the generative AI train as well, with Baidu teasing a local version of ChatGPT, plus Fudan University launching their version 2 that actually managed to crash under high demand just for it to be removed from the 
public. Funnily, that tool apparently still works better in English as well rather than in Chinese because there's apparently just more high quality English content on the internet that can be indexed easily than there is Chinese stuff. Plus the Chinese stuff is also often heavily censored. So there's that, they still have some work to do. But yeah, what a wild week. This industry is moving faster than any other that I've seen before. Okay, and for my second story of the week, we have to talk about Mercedes-Benz announcing its new and kind of ridiculous 2024 E-Class interior. This car will have a selfie camera and integrated TikTok and Zoom apps so you can post TikToks or take video calls straight from your car. And a genius move, I guess, Mercedes. I mean, I hope that they let people watermark these videos right away. Like imagine taking a Zoom call and then your image actually says captured on my Mercedes-Benz E-Class right away. You just broadcast your status to the peasantry right away. I think people would pay for that. <laughs> Anyway, thankfully, video conferencing and photography plus filming TikTok videos will only be possible when the car is stopped. So, you know, safety first, I guess. But the E-Class is Mercedes's best-selling model, and the company has been pretty aggressive in adding tech to it in general. So with this version, there'll be a new giant touchscreen called the Super Screen, which now combines the large standard central touchscreen with a second display in front of the passenger. So there's all kinds of places to look at instead of the road. And on top of just that, there's even a 17 speaker Burmester 4D surround sound system and get this lighting and music presets for things like date night that plays romantic tunes and uses pink lighting. I mean, you probably know my stance on cars by now, so you probably expect me to find this brain meltingly dumb and I do, but I bet that Mercedes actually did like a million consumer studies and found out that this is exactly what consumers want. So there we go. Okay, and my last story of the week is going to have all of the best and worst of Apple combined. So the good and the bad news start with USB-C, which is now pretty clearly confirmed to launch in the iPhone 15 this fall. This week, the actual 3D CAD files for both the iPhone 15 and 15 Pro were leaked, which are usually sent around to case makers, so their products are ready when the iPhone launches. Max Weinbach over at 9to5Mac managed to publish those and they confirmed a few details. First, there's slightly bigger dimensions again. Second, the notch is going away on all models to be replaced by the dynamic island, not just on the Pro one, but on all of them. And third, USB-C is officially replacing Lightning as well. The EU laws would force a mandate starting in December 2024, so theoretically, Apple could have left the iPhone on Lightning for one more year, but it looks like they chose to make the jump right away. I'm pretty excited about having some cross-compatibility between the accessories ecosystems of iOS and Android, but of course, Apple seems to have found a way to make some lemons out of this lemonade. So rumors a few weeks ago suggested that Apple might opt for authenticator chips for both the USB-C port and the accompanying charging cables too, potentially limiting functionality with accessories that are not approved by Apple. From my quick research, it seems that the company has not done that with iPads with USB-C in the past, so that is kind of strange, and we don't know what exactly the limitations on the iPhone will be. Is it a way to limit fast charging standards or maybe require a set of minimum quality standards for their cables? Or is it just a way to raise the walls around their walled gardens and keep charging an entrance fee even when they can't use their own port? I guess we'll have to wait and see. Now, beside USB-C, we've also learned this week that Apple has apparently secured 100% of TSMC's M3 Note manufacturing capacity for the A17 and M3 SoCs, according to Korean reporting, which is pretty nuts, and that means that they will have an active manufacturing advantage over everyone else, leading to performance and battery life benefits, perhaps for a whole generation. And while we're still talking about Apple, Bloomberg reports detailed one of the company's true moonshots, which is non-invasive blood glucose monitoring in the Apple Watch. Apparently, over a decade of work has gotten the tech down to the size of an iPhone, and the next step is shrinking that down even further to fit into a watch, and if they manage that, that will be pretty damn incredible. Then, next week is also going to bring MWC with tons of new announcements, and so my researcher Tristan and I have discussed all the things that we expect to see getting launched in our podcast, The Friday Chillout, plus we also went a little deeper on Apple's blood glucose monitoring device, since Tristan has some first-hand experience with the topic. This is already 
episode five of the Friday Chill Out, and I'm super happy with the feedback that we've received so far. I love having this format where we can go a little bit more in depth with our thoughts and that we can finally also engage in a more meaningful way with our listeners too, through our mailbag section, which every week gets us lots of really interesting questions. This week's episode is live right now, both as an audio and a video version on Nebula, and you can find links to both down in the description. Nebula always gets the podcast first and the video version is exclusive to it too, and then the audio version goes to the public feed later. Links and descriptions for everything are down below. And here's the deal, an ad-supported business model for a podcast of our scale simply does not work. So instead of trying to jam ads into the free version anyway, this podcast is 100% financed by Nebula subscribers like you. I would literally not know how to finance the podcast if it wasn't for Nebula subscribers. So if you want the show to run and to continue running a month or even years from now, please consider subscribing. And if you do, be sure to use my link. This lets Nebula know that I sent you and actually also gets you a $20 discount on yearly plans now. So it all costs less than three bucks a month. Your subscriptions have already directly funded many of my projects in the past, including a whole class that I recently released on Nebula about my end-to-end -end video making process for the Friday Checkout, which is available now through the new Nebula Classes platform, as well as two whole series of my Nebula original series, Technorama. So thanks for the support in the past. I hope you find the new stuff worthy of support as well, and I'll see you next Friday.